This episode is brought to you by Talkiatry. Say hello to Talkiatry. They offer virtual in-network psychiatry to treat the most common mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, OCD, and trauma. Within a week, Talkiatry will match you with a doctor who fits your needs and takes your insurance. If you're ready for more accessible, more human psychiatry, let's talk. Get started at Takayatri.com slash start. That's Takayatri dot com slash start. If you have a kid that's collecting stuff, so you've got a kid that has a really hard time getting rid of clothes that don't fit anymore, for example, or if they decide that they're going to keep all of the empty toilet paper or paper towel rolls. I read a case study where a child had about 500 of them stored in their bedroom. If you have a child that has difficulty getting rid of things that you would consider trash, so they might be candy wrappers or birthday candles from their birthday cake, they might have difficulty throwing away toys or giving away toys that they no longer use. One of the things that we want to look at is that these people, children and adults alike, have a real difficulty making decisions. Welcome to Fluster Clucks with Lynn Lyons, where we talk about how to manage those tricky emotions that show up in all families. Serious stuff without being too serious. I'm your co-host, Robin, and I'm Lynn's sister-in-law, and I'm here to ask your questions. And I'm Lynn Lyons. I'm an anxiety expert, speaker, mom, and author, and I've been a therapist for over 30 years. Parenting can be a Fluster Clucks, and I'm here to help you find your way. And I'll even tell you what to do and what to say. Hey, Robin. Hello. So we have an episode this week. I'm going to be talking about this issue of hoarding and how we can tell the difference between your kid likes to collect stuff and your kid has a problem. But before we dive into that, I just want to give a little follow up to our last episode, which was about when anxiety turns to anger and when it gets aggressive, because I got some questions from people. Clearly, that issue touched a nerve, which I would anticipate that it might. And I just want to say one thing kind of as a follow-up to that. If you have a child that then turns into a teenager that is being violent, that is being aggressive and destructive, I just caution that you don't say, well, this violence must be because of anxiety. There is no justification for a young person to become physically violent, either with family members or with partners. Some of the feedback that I was getting was like, oh, this must explain my child or my teenager's violent behavior. If your child is aggressive and violent and you say to yourself, to them, or to anybody else, well, the reason that they're so aggressive is really because they're anxious. One, that's not always the case. And two, that is still not an excuse or a reason for you to either absolve them of their violence or to enable them by giving them a justification or a reason. So I just wanted to put that out there. If you've got a child who's being violent, who's being aggressive, get help and do something about it. I heard some enabling language coming to me, which sort of made me go, no, no, no. So I just want to put that out there. It's so important. Yeah. Yeah. Again, this is one of those things where we really want people to be aware of mental health. We really want them to know what's going on. It is not a reason to enable or dismiss such behavior. And that's what I was hearing. So I just want to make sure that I'm clear about that. Okay, so today we're going to talk about hoarding with kids and what mm-hmm. is maybe normal kid-like behavior and then mm-hmm. when is hoarding an issue? Yes. Yeah. So let me start with normal kid-like behavior. Little kids like to collect things. They like to pick up pretty rocks. They like to pick up seashells at the seashore. They have their action figures. They have, for example, their Star Wars figures that somebody might have carefully collected and put away. We're laughing because my brother had this Star Wars figure collection. And I think that's why Robin fell in love with my brother. (laughs) It's so true. (laughs) I didn't tell you this though, but actually father and son, do you know what they've done with that collection now? What are they doing? 
they've discovered a love for eBay. Oh, and they're selling those figures together. And my son is quite the entrepreneur. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we have a collection of Star Wars Lego sets in our basement that I think in retrospect could have put both of my kids through college. They are like in their boxes. So we may discover eBay as well. Well, or you could just bring them at Christmas (laughs) and my son will be very glad to sell them and share profit with you. Yeah. Oh, that's true. Okay. So maybe there's a partnership in the works. So collecting things like that, having collections, and certainly there are a lot of people that have collections of things they love. So let me just differentiate between that desire of particularly little kids to pick things up and have a little collection and when it becomes problematic, when it becomes hoarding. Here is the criteria for clinical hoarding, and this is really what we're looking at in adults, but as I'll get to in a moment, it shows up in kids as well. But here's what we are looking for. It says, the acquisition of and failure to discard a large number of possessions that appear to be useless or of limited value. Now, again, you've got a little kid who's collecting rocks. You're like, these are of limited value. But, okay, so that's only one. That's only one criteria. Here's the next one. Living spaces are sufficiently cluttered so as to preclude activities for which those spaces were designed. In other words, you've got so much crap in your house that you can't sit on the couch, you can't sleep in your bed, you're not using your stove, no countertops are available, and there is significant distress or impairment in the functioning of the people in the house or the people who are doing the hoarding that's caused by it. When we're looking at clinical hoarding, one of the things we're really paying attention to in adults is when has the hoarding of the stuff impaired your functioning? That's when it becomes a problem. So if you have a collection, if it's neatly put away, if you enjoy collecting, blah, 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 that's not necessarily hoarding. It's when it becomes so overwhelming that people can't even live in their house. Yeah. So hoarding is also a separate disorder. It exists with or without OCD. But when we're talking about this with kids, there is a real overlap with hoarding and OCD, and there actually is not much research at all on kids that just have hoarding disorder. Don't get concerned about all the clinical differentiations and all the research terms that people use, because that can make it a little overwhelming. We just want to look at the behavior of kids and what to do about them, what to do about these behaviors and how to help, which I'll talk about. Before we get into the kids, can I stop and ask you this question? Yes. Because when you talk about hoarding or just having a home that is just filled with things that prevent a normal way to live, Mm -hmm. I think there are a ton of families that have toy issues that Mm -hmm. may or may not come from the kid, but obviously the parents could be allowing the acquisition of more and more and more toys too. Mm -hmm. This is a very common thing. Can we talk about parents, the kids of the toys first before we go into the kids? Yeah. So one of the things when we look at hoarding, they break it up in a few categories. And one of the things is that there are people who hoard stuff that they don't buy. They find stuff. So they pick stuff up off the road or they take it out of other people's trash, that kind of stuff. But then there's this other category of people who hoard where acquisition is a real problem. So not only do you have the compulsive buying, but then you have the compulsive hoarding. So that's what we see when there are parents who are just buying tons and tons of clothes for their kids, tons and tons of toys. So they keep bringing stuff in and there's no getting rid of or letting things go, which is actually one of the solutions that I'm going to talk about when we get to that part is that how do you address that? Yeah. Not everybody who does this is the same, but you do have people that are compulsive buyers, compulsive acquisitioners, and then they don't get rid of stuff. Yep, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking also about the parents. You know, you talk about self care and self medication and regret Mm -hmm. management. And there are a lot of parents who have Amazon addictions. So there's just like so many boxes are showing up every day. So if someone is receiving a lot of Amazon packages and they aren't making the connection to what you're about to talk about, maybe Mm -hmm. it's a good time to sort of 
what should we be thinking about? Right, exactly. Because it can happen on both ends. It can happen on the input and on the output. When we're talking about hoarding, when we're talking about this behavior, what we're really paying attention to is the difficulty in getting rid of stuff. And it can be stuff that's valuable or deemed valuable or thought of as valuable, but it also can be stuff that's thought of as absolutely useless. Yeah. When we see hoarding in children, it can appear in children as early as six or seven. It's usually diagnosed alongside OCD or some other disorder. We know that with kids that have OCD and adults that have OCD, about 25 to 30% of them will also have symptoms of compulsive hoarding. So it sort of shows up together. Let me tell you, there's a, a really important difference that is made between pure hoarding and OCD hoarding. I'm really talking about sort of the OCD hoarding combination today because that's what we really see a lot in kids. So here's the prominent difference that you want to pay attention to. If somebody is hoarding and it's not within the context of OCD, right? They're just pure hoarders. And again, very little research. I couldn't find any research on pure hoarders in kids. But if they have pure hoarding, they are not distressed. They are not negative about their hoarding. It doesn't cause them any difficulty. So they may be living in squalor. And sometimes you see this on that show that's on TV of hoarding, which is actually pretty distressing for me, the way that they deal with a lot of that. But they're not distressed about it. They don't really have a lot of insight. They're totally fine. They love acquiring stuff. They love keeping stuff in their house. They may be living in piles and piles of junk. Doesn't bother them. It's not a problem. It's called egocentonic, actually, which means they're like, yeah, this is fine. The problem comes when anybody tries to get rid of their stuff. But if you have hoarding that's sort of connected to OCD, then it causes you a lot of distress. There's a lot of distress in the whole process because there are reasons that you're keeping stuff that have to do with your OCD intrusive thoughts and compulsions. So that's a distinction to be made. If you are a pure hoarder, you don't care. You pick up trash, you keep it in the house, fine with you. If you have the OCD part of it, which a lot of people do, a lot of kids do, then there's a lot more distress. So I think what we should do is we can take a break and I'm going to go through that connection. How does OCD stuff result in the hoarding? Because that's what we're really going to see in kids. So Robin, I bet you're getting geared up for the holidays. You know I love the holidays. I know you do. I know you love decorating. Your house always looks so beautiful. How about gift giving? I'm getting my grandmother the skylight frame, and I have been wanting to give this to her for months, and I'm so excited. It's an easy gift to give, and it's all about connection, really. So the skylight frame is this very genius use of technology. It's a beautiful black frame with a white mat, very classic looking. However, it's connected to a Wi-Fi network, and you can send photos to your relative and they will get updated automatically. So this is an amazing gift if you have relatives who are not with phones. For example, my 98-year-old grandmother. I'm so excited to share photos of our family with her in real time. I think this is such a genius invention. I'm going to get one for my parents as well. The thing that's great about it is that all of the family members can send photos to this one frame. It's a great way to keep large networks of families in touch. You can choose two different sizes. There's a 10 inch size and a larger 15 inch size frame. And if you don't love your skylight, they'll offer you a full refund. You can get $15 off your purchase of a skylight frame when you go to skylightframe.com and enter the code FLUSTERCLUCKS. To get $15 off your purchase of a skylight frame, just go to skylightframe.com and enter the code FLUSTERCLUCKS, and that's S-K-Y-L-I-G-H-T frame, F-R-A-M-E dot com. Promo code is FLUSTERCLUCKS. Robin, you know what I love about our listeners? What's that? They are so engaged. I mean, we've got a great group on Facebook. We get questions all the time. These are a group of listeners that are just really thinking about things. They're really trying to do the best for their families. These are people who are really paying attention. They're really trying to make things better. They're looking for answers. So if you have a company and you're thinking, gosh, 
I would like to advertise in a podcast that has really engaged listeners. I would like to advertise in a podcast that has customers that are looking for solutions, that are looking for things to make their lives better. I think we're a really good fit. If you're trying to make a family's life better or a parent's life better, we've got your audience. So let us know and sponsor your company on Flusterclux. Go to flusterclux.com under work with us and you'll get all the information that you need to advertise your business. Okay, Lynn, what were you saying? If you are distressed, here's what's going on. If you have a kid that's collecting stuff, so you've got a kid that has a really hard time getting rid of clothes that don't fit anymore, for example, or if they decide that they're going to keep all of the empty toilet paper or paper towel rolls. I read a case study where a child had about 500 of them stored in their bedroom. If you have a child that has difficulty getting rid of things that you would consider trash, so they might be candy wrappers or birthday candles from their birthday cake, They might have difficulty throwing away toys or giving away toys that they no longer use, that they have trouble giving away books or other items that they've outgrown that maybe are baby toys. One of the things that we want to look at is that these people, children and adults alike, have a real difficulty making decisions. So what they're doing is they're trying to decide what should they keep and what should they get rid of. There's a big correlation between this kind of keeping of stuff and perfectionism. There's a big correlation between keeping this stuff and worrying that they're going to get rid of something and then regret it, that they might need it later, that what if I throw away this thing And then later on, I wish I had it, and that is going to make me feel really upset. So what they're doing is they're not keeping this stuff because they love the stuff. They're keeping this stuff because they don't know how to make a decision about what stays and what goes. So what happens is saving the stuff allows this hoarder to avoid the decision that's required to throw it away. And what they then do is they avoid having to worry about making a mistake that they threw something away that they needed. So they're basically saving to avoid decision making. They don't want to go through everything. They're saving this item because the process of going through and deciding whether to keep it or get rid of it is so time consuming. It's so difficult. It's so distressing that they say, I'm just going to keep everything so that I don't have to make a decision. The joyful hoarder Mm -hmm. is collecting everything because they're programmed to love the collection. Correct. They just want the stuff. They're not even thinking about struggling to get rid of anything. It's just collect more and more and more. That's right. Whereas the OCD, there's an awareness that things should be thrown away, but it's producing all this stress because, but what if I need this later? But what if this? And then that's what makes them paralyzed. That's exactly correct. Yep. The pure hoarder is just like, I've got this stuff. They don't even go through the process. But somebody with OCD thinks, okay, I know there's a pile of this stuff. And I don't think I really need it. And I actually feel kind of ashamed and embarrassed that I'm doing this. But the idea of making these decisions, of going through this and deciding what stays and goes, I know I should do that, but it's so hard and it's going to take up so much time and it's going to cause me so much distress. I'm just going to not do it. So this is the case oftentimes when you have somebody who's an OCD hoarder, a lot of times their stuff is very well contained. I mean, it takes over spaces in their house, but it's in plastic bins or it's in boxes or it's in neat piles everywhere because they recognize like, oh gosh, I've got all this stuff and I don't know what to do with it. And I'm going to try and organize it. I'm going to try and make it look like it's okay. I'm going to try and justify it. Sometimes they hide it. The pure hoarder doesn't care. Nobody sits on the couch. Nobody sleeps on the bed. Who cares? It's a different thinking process for sure. It's interesting as you say that. I have bins of kids' clothes up in my attic. Mm -hmm. 
However, I think a lot of moms listening to this might relate because I have put everything that the kids have outgrown. I put them in a bin and then I determine, do I give them to friends or do I donate them to charity? Or I used to do yard sales, you know, when they were younger. Mm -hmm. They stay there not because I don't know what I want to get rid of. I simply don't have time. Right. And so I'm just hoping that you say that that is a distinction. I mean, once I have time and I allocate it to that task, Mm -hmm. I think I go through with it. But it's funny, my husband and I, your brother, he's the kind of guy who would just throw everything away. Mm -hmm. But I'm the person who knows if we have to buy it again, how much it costs. Mm -hmm. So there's a balance where sometimes I don't think I'm a hoarder, but I also say, you know, you think that this isn't something, you know, that's a big deal, but this is something that we use a few times a year. And it costs a lot of money to replace. So that's not a practical thing to throw away. I just think the gauge of normal is important here. And what we want to look at is that we're all making decisions what to keep and what to get rid of. And so it's a matter of degree. Mm -hmm. I can relate right now in my clothes closet, which is pretty neatly organized. I know probably in that closet, 50% of the clothes I never wear. I have to go through it. And I have to get rid of those clothes. But the idea of doing that task, I'm like, oh, I just keep putting it off. If I had this OCD difficulty, I would have a really difficult time deciding what stays and goes because another characteristic of this is that they have a really difficult time deciding what's important and what's not. They have a difficult time differentiating. If I were having this problem with my closet, every piece of clothing that I took out, I would assign value to that. It might be emotional value. I might think, well, I'm going to wear this again. I might have a memory attached to it. I might think, oh, what if I'm going to go to a wedding in 10 years from now and I'm going to wish I had that thing? So they have a very difficult time distinguishing between stuff that I'm going to use and stuff that I'm not going to use, stuff that's important and stuff that's not important. Mm. The other side with OCD is that people will have no clutter in their house. So they go through and get rid of everything all the time. That's a problem also. They want their house to be perfect and it's zero tolerance for any clutter. So they throw away other people's stuff. I have a family member like that, actually. Yep. There's a, a woman who's in my family too, who I think of in my extended family. And I'm curious how she would react to this because she's very organized at keeping things. And she has kind of the Great Depression economic values, Mm -hmm. you know, so she believes in saving things. But I feel like she keeps things and then fashion kind of comes back. So she's got this collection of phenomenal vintage purses, vintage shoes, vintage jeans Mm -hmm. that she knows how to access and pass along to relatives, right? Like that's a healthy way. Oh, yeah. She has an amazing collection of holiday decor and costumes, and she has a bin that's just for that. So I feel like there is, a, you know, just distinguishing, because I think a lot of moms are hearing this and saying, uh-oh. <laughs> you no, know, it's thinking about the healthy range. Correct. It's all about ranges. It's all about ranges. And here's a really important distinction. What we're looking at is the way the child feels about getting rid of stuff. Say they have a bunch of pants that no longer fit them. They can't even get them on. And you say to your child, who's maybe now 10, you say, hey, you know what? You've got in your drawer, you've been saving all of those pants and shorts from when you were four. And there's no way that you're ever going to be able to wear those again. I think we need to go through your drawers and we can give those things away. We can look and see what's still usable. We can donate them to Goodwill. We can bring them to a consignment store. We can give them to your little cousin who they might fit. Let's look through. If you've got a child who has difficulty with this, they will freak out when you propose that you're going to get rid of stuff, that you're going to throw something away. You know, maybe they love crayons and they've got a bin of a thousand broken crayons and you say, what I think we should do Let's go through and let's pick out a nice selection of crayons, the ones that aren't broken. They will freak out. You're bringing up great examples of used and broken crayons or pants because I think it really helps magnify the pathological reaction. Mm -hmm. But 
I think it's normal for kids to have a harder time letting go of books and toys they have technically outgrown because they see them and they're like, oh, I loved that book. I loved that toy. Right. So that's a little more within the range of normal, right? Correct. It's all a matter of degree. And remember, when I listed the first criteria is that you've got to have so much stuff in your house or in your living area that it's impeding your ability to function. Now, one of the things that happens with kids versus adults is that usually we don't allow kids to take over the whole house. So it may be limited to their bedroom. You may notice that their closet is just stuffed and stuffed and stuffed because they have an area in their house that they're allowed to call their own and they're allowed to have their stuff in it. You wouldn't let them put their stuff all over the house. Once there's an adult who owns their own house, then that's when we see it just taking over rooms. If you had a kid that was a hoarder, you wouldn't let them put their stuff on your bed so that you couldn't sleep in your bed. But with an adult who's a hoarder, they put stuff on everybody's bed so that there are kids whose parents are hoarders and the kids are sleeping on the floor because there's no room on their bed to sleep. 50% of hoarders have never used their stove or oven because they've got stuff hoarded in their oven and on top of their stove. In the show Sex in the City, Carrie Bradshaw always said she used her oven to store shoes. That's a New York City apartment real estate issue. <laughs> That's a New York City apartment. You use your oven for storage rather than for cooking. So all of our 212 and 718 and all of those area codes, you get a pass. <laughs> yeah, you get a pass. If you're keeping your jewelry in your microwave, you're good. So, But it really is what you want to pay attention to is the degree of it for sure. And it's the emotional distress that's caused by it. Parents, you can sort of trust your gut on this a little bit. You know, if you've got a little kid who likes to bring home pretty rocks and has this little box and they keep their pretty rocks, I'm not going to say, oh my gosh, they have a hoarding problem. But if you've got a kid who keeps bringing stuff in or has a really hard time throwing away or giving away stuff that is either useless or no, long no longer useful to them, and when you propose that you're going to get rid of some of this stuff, they freak out, that's when you want to pay attention. It really is very much connected to this idea of what if I make a mistake? What if I need it later? What if I throw this out and I regret it? So I'm just going to avoid making that decision. And then the other way the OCD stuff ties into it is that you're really worried about waste. So what if I throw something out that's still usable, right? I could use this again or somebody could use this. And so that shows up a lot as well. Yeah. Do you feel that kids could become hoarders in a family where there's been no hoarding modeled? Let's take a break. I can talk a little bit about what we're going to do about it, how we're going to help, and I'm going to talk about family modeling. Okay, we're back. Okay, Lynn, so when we talk about the family modeling, I can't help but keep imagining this one image as you've been talking about this. When your kids are little, when you have little kids, like that two and three-year-old age particularly, there are so many homes where every single surface is filled with little toys. And that is not the kid. That's the parent. Right. We know with OCD, remember, there's a strong genetic push in OCD. And hoarding, again, is sort of its own separate thing, but there's OCD hoarding. And again, this is just all the, the slicing it fine in the way that we distinguish with these things. But it is very likely that if you have a child who's exhibiting this behavior, that there is a very close relative or relatives that also have this behavior. It has been modeled. I have talked to many adults and kids too, but many adults who will say, I never learned, nobody ever showed me how to go through my stuff and get rid of it. And the message that I got from my mom was, oh my gosh, we should keep this. I had one, one woman tell me that her mother saved every paper that came home from school from the time that she was in kindergarten all the way up through high school. And she would say to her child, I don't know when I'm going to want to go back and look at this. This is such wonderful memories. I'm going to keep this. And she said, I was taught that 
when you get something, it's too valuable to get rid of. She said that has been very pervasive in the way that I think about my own house and my own kids. It's that same combination of nature and nurture. It shows up early. We know there's a genetic push, but it really is modeled at the same time. Can I give a little parenting tip here? And I know I'm not the only mom who does this. Yeah. I used to have an app that did it, but now you don't even need an app. Create an album in your photos app on your phone Mm -hmm. called Kids Art Projects. Mm. And then take photos of them and then just store them in that album. And then you can make a note on the year, you'll know the age. Mm -hmm. But we did do that. And it was a great way to say, like, if we had a house big enough to store all of your beautiful art, it would be a ginormous, (laughs) a ginormous home with 50 rooms. So we're going to take these photos so that we can always go back and look at your journey as an artist, as an example. Mm -hmm. And that helped them understand we valued their art. We're throwing it away, though, because we can't (laughs) keep everything. That was a very good little hack. Yep, that's a great idea. My kids had tons of art. We had it up on the kitchen wall. For years and years, we just our whole kitchen wall was covered. The school they went to would have these art shows, so they would actually like mount and frame their artwork. So it was really beautifully presented. And then it got to the point where we weren't going to have it up anymore. And we went through and I just said to them, pick the ones that you really like. Pick the things that you think are really cool. It was surprising to me that they were like, Ugh, I've always hated that one up on the wall. They picked like two or three things that they thought that they wanted to keep. And then the others went away. It is a really good skill to teach. And remember that you are modeling a skill. And the skill is the ability to let go of things, not knowing exactly what the outcome is going to be. You might miss it. I have this clothing suit that I threw away and a dress that I gave away. Even now I'll think like, why did I give away that dress? It's okay, right? I'm living my life without that dress. So it's a skill that we teach. The other thing too, this is an an important thing to recognize as well, is that a lot of times when you're talking about getting rid of something with kids, it's the anticipation of letting it go that's much harder. The worry about getting rid of it, the feeling about getting rid of it, actually when they get rid of it, it's not a problem. So one of the things that I do clinically is that say I've got a family in my practice and they're doing this. The homework assignment that I'll give is that I'll give them a little bag and I want you to go home and I want you to fill the bag up with some of the stuff that you know you're collecting or hoarding in your bedroom. It might be papers or whatever. I want you to bring the bag back to me and I'm going to keep it in my office. And I want you to just feel what it feels like to not have that stuff in your room. And what often happens is they never ask for it again. That once they give it up, once they let go of it, They don't miss it. It was the anticipation of missing it or the process of deciding what to get rid of. So it's a very interesting thing that happens. You get rid of the stuff and then you don't really even miss it. I want to share in case this is relevant to any listeners. I had this one chapter when my mom passed away. I went to her house and was able to take pieces of furniture and art, et cetera, back to my home. Mm Mm-hmm. My mom and I had an exceptionally close relationship and I was devastated with grief. And those things were sustaining me in the early stages of my loss. Mm -hmm. I even had like all of these cashmere sweaters and jewelry of hers. And I gave myself some grace and I said, you probably took more than you should have and you need to deal with this later, Mm -hmm. but you're in a lot of pain right now. Yes. I can tell you from my exact experience that there was a day when I know my grief had reached a certain point. I was like, let's just get rid of this. Mm -hmm. I almost said a swear word. (laughs) But so I was able to let it go. Yeah. I think that that kind of thing happens where sometimes stuff is hard to let go. Well, because there's an emotional connection. That's nostalgia that we keep things because of that. And again, it's all a matter of degree. When you are grieving somebody or you are moving into a new stage of your life and you have to say goodbye to something, we often keep objects that are representative of that time because it helps us connect back. And that's normal. What we have to recognize, remember, is that what happens with this problem 
One is that you are attributing value to things that don't really have value, that you have a difficult time differentiating between what's important and what's not important. A candy wrapper doesn't have value. A broken crayon, but you put value upon it. The stuff that you were dealing with as you were grieving your mom and saying goodbye to your mom, you were figuring out what your connection was going to be to her after her death. And there was a stage of acute grieving And that's what you were dealing with. Now, knowing you, right, your grief has moved to a different stage, which allows you to recognize what's important and not important in keeping your connection to your mom. And the cashmere sweaters are less important, but telling the memories and stories, right, you often share with me things. You were telling me the other day, oh, you would have really liked this about my mom. That's the way that you're staying connected to her. You went through that stage of moving from acute grief which was truly, I can't make these decisions right now. I'm not in a place emotionally where I can make a decision about what's important to me. Totally normal. When somebody has this hoarding thing, everything feels like that. Like that's how it is about toilet paper rolls. I can't make this decision right now whether or not I need 70 toilet paper rolls or 200 toilet paper rolls. It's not rational. What you described with your mom, that's a rational process of moving through grief and figuring out how you're going to stay connected to your mom. But mm-hmm. this is not a rational process. Yeah, This was really great because I think that there are a lot of ways that listeners can think about this and think about the stuff in their environments mm-hmm. and the emotional patterns they have with each of them, or if there are any noticeable skills missing. Yeah. If you recognize this as a process that you need to take care of with your family or that you want to address, here's some do's and don'ts, okay? So the first one, this is a hard one. Don't judge the lack of value or the value of what your kids are collecting, right? So saying to them, you know what? This is just trash or this is junk or I don't know why you think this is valuable. Keep those shaming judgment words to yourself because they already feel a lot of shame about this. And remember, it's not a rational assessment of what's valuable and not valuable. If they can do that, they wouldn't have the problem. So keep that to yourself, okay? It's the process that we're working on here, not the items themselves. The second thing you want to do is you want to talk about this process, this pattern of behavior, just as we talk about all the other anxiety behaviors or the OCD behaviors that we talk about on this podcast. I want you to externalize it. You want to become observers of this behavior and pattern so that you can create a distance from it. So if you can talk about it, you know, we pull it out that you've got hoarding Harry, right? Or whatever you want to call it, so that you are on the same team with your child in addressing this as a really controlling and often embarrassing and shameful problem. They're having difficulty. This is a really hard thing for them to deal with, and it's really hard for them to get rid of stuff. It's a powerfully, emotionally laden, sticky mess that their brains are in. Again, remember, it runs in the family. So pay attention to what you are modeling and what other relatives are modeling. It can be helpful to talk about the other relatives that do this, to observe it. So you say, you know how when we go to grandma's house, blah, 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 or you know when we go over to Uncle Harry's, blah, 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 so that they have an idea about that. Talk about it openly as something that runs in families so that your kids can know they're not alone in this and it helps to normalize it. You also want to limit the space that's available. For example, you want to say to them as you're working on this, you have this one bin in your bedroom that you can keep stuff in, but you can't use more than this bin. You also want to make sure that if you give them a space in their room, it has to have a top on it because they will go vertical. They will stack things. If they can stack it on their bed, if they can stack it on their desk, Pay attention to their closet. If they're just shoving things into their closet, you want to have an area where they're allowed to keep stuff that's contained both horizontally and vertically, right? A bin with a cover on it. The other thing that you want to talk to them about, and this is great for all families actually, is a one in, one out policy. So if you get a new shirt, then we're going to get rid of a shirt. If you pick up a rock, then we're going to get rid of a rock so that they are learning the process of when we accumulate things, something else goes. 
So that's a way you can limit the accumulation of new items and keep this as a rule. It manages the number of hoarded items that are brought into the house, and it also allows them to have practice making decisions about what they deem as worthy. Is this valuable enough for me to bring into the home? Because I'm going to have to get rid of something in order to bring this into the home. Remember that this is a decision-making process for a lot of kids. When my kids were younger, I would say, you have to determine what we're getting rid of in order to make room for new toys. Right. And so there was a forced, repetitive process they knew they had to do every year. Yep. And that's really good practice. If you're listening to this and you're recognizing that maybe you're somebody who's doing this, you can put into place that rule, that one in, one out rule for yourself as well. The other thing too, rewards are okay with this as you're practicing, but make sure you're not rewarding with stuff, right? Because then that just sort of defeats the purpose. But it's really hard. They need lots of love and support. There has to be consistency. You have to really maintain your vanilla ice cream in this as you're working through it. You want to practice getting rid of stuff. You just have to know and talk about ahead of time with your kids that they're going to have really big feelings as this happens, and that's okay. There's one more thing that I want to mention. There is a correlation that they have found in executive functioning issues and kids that hoard. Now, one researcher said that there seems to be an increase in this hoarding behavior if you have ADHD. But another big study said you don't really fit the criteria for ADHD in its entirety, but we are seeing difficulty with executive functioning, which again ties into this decision making process and also organizational difficulties. So pay attention to that as well. The end goal of this is to be able to throw things away so that you limit how much new stuff they acquire. And the goal is to keep their rooms livable. Because when this goes into adulthood, that's what happens. Living spaces become unlivable. The last thing I want to say about this is that if a child has OCD with hoarding as a part of their OCD, that does not mean that their OCD is worse. It doesn't mean that they won't respond to treatment. It doesn't mean that it's a bigger problem. It's just that this is the way the OCD shows up. It can be difficult, but I talk to a lot of families where OCD is going on. It's not about hoarding. It might be about germs. It might be about other things. Hoarding with the OCD is not indicative of a worse problem, just a different problem. So that's important to keep in mind. This is something you want to tackle early. You want to go after it. You want to pay attention to your modeling and you want to be consistent. Now, as we're heading into the holiday season, you may not be able to tackle this between now and December 25th, but pay attention to what you're bringing into the house. Pay attention to what you're modeling. It's a workable problem. It is not, quite honestly, it's not an easy problem to fix, but we can really make a difference. It shows up early in kids. Six, seven, five, if you see it, get on it, get on it, and you can make a difference. Can I just ask for, as a takeaway, as a listener of your advice here, especially for the earlier ages, developing the skill of knowing how to let go of something is key. So when you have a three, four, or five-year-old, a great way to do this is to say, we're going to have to clean out our canned goods. Mm -hmm. I'd love for you to help me and let's make a donation to the food pantry or let's see if anything has expired. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the numbers on them. Getting practice with that and doing that is a skill that you could work on with them together. That's right. Anytime you're modeling it. So even if you're sitting there and you're going through your pocketbook or whatever, and you're taking stuff out and you're saying out loud to your little kid, oh, I don't need this anymore. It's time to throw this away. Oh, oh, I'm going to keep this. Oh, I found this. I didn't know that I had this. Oh, boy, this, this is so outdated. 
you're showing them that skill over and over and over again. If this episode was helpful to you, you can join our Facebook community and we'd love it if you left a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Fluster Clucks. Bye, Robin. Bye, Lynn. Real truth alert. Pregnancy, birth, and having a baby isn't all sunshine and rainbows. I wish it were. But the reality is that many people struggle and suffer through this time without the right help or even knowing what they're dealing with. I'm perinatal psychologist, Dr. Katayun Kayeni, also known as Dr. Kat. My podcast, Mom in Mind, aims to shine a light on the difficult reality that so many hopeful and new parents experience and raise the volume on how we can better support mental health, which is a big part of our overall health. Episodes include personal stories from people who have healed through things like pregnancy and postpartum anxiety, depression, PTSD, and so much more. I also talk with specialists and experts who explain and educate on these conditions. All of this to support parents to know that they are not alone, that healing is possible, and there are resources that can help you today. Listen into Mom and Mind and walk with me through the world of perinatal mental health.